This Christmas, I bear the gift of good news. We are on the cusp of integrating 2D inkjet cartridges with 3D printing to make full color 3D prints. It's called PolyDye, and today I'll show you where it's at and invite you to help develop it. My patron Jack has been working on PolyDye for four years now. It's definitely a labor of love. With the support of his wife Bianca, who has her own YouTube channel I've linked below, it's gotten to the point where others can start trialing it. The aim of this video is not to create an exhaustive step-by-step -step guide, but rather show you what it is, how it works, and where it still needs work. So what exactly is PolyDye? PolyDye is a system made up of firmware and custom electronics. It kind of acts like Octoprint on a Raspberry Pi, in that it runs the prints and feeds G-code commands through to the printer line by line. The difference here is that the PolyDye system can also interface with a regular 2D inkjet cartridge. It clips into a printed mount right in front of the 3D printer toolhead. And as you might have guessed, that gives our 3D printer the ability to 2D print in full color. So that means for each layer, we lay down our 3D printed plastic, followed by our 2D color, and then the process repeats. And that, as you can see, means full color 3D printing from an inexpensive hobby FDM 3D printer. So why is this so significant? The vast majority of hobby 3D printers can only print in a single filament and therefore color at a time. Some printers have multiple independent tool heads, such as this IDEX you're seeing here, and that means a different color of filament can be loaded into each, allowing multicolor prints. Scale that concept up to a tool changer like the Prusa XL, which has five independent heads and therefore allows five separate colors. The problem here being that the XL is quite expensive. There are of course much cheaper options like the various AMS systems from Bamboo Lab. The problem here is that the multiple colors still feed through a single tool head. So anytime there's a color change, the old filament needs to be purged. So while the prints do look good and it is quite reliable, there's still a lot of material wastage. I've tested other multicolor ideas over the years, such as a mixing hot end, which can blend two different colors throughout the print. This is novel, but there's just not the control of which colors go where. Solutions do exist, but they are for industrial use only, such as PolyJet from Stratasys. This system offers full color, including translucent in a range of different materials. The prints look outstanding, but they're not for consumer use. And you know the price is expensive because they won't list it, they have a get a quote button instead. So any full color process that can be done at home without spending a fortune really is a tremendous breakthrough. Before we continue, a few things. The hardware that you're seeing in this video was sent to me free of charge by Jacques so I could help with testing and bring you this video. Secondly, we need to admire what exactly has happened here. Imagine taking a proprietary ink cartridge, working out the interface, the software protocol, and then developing all of the custom electronics, firmware and software to integrate it with 3D printing. What you're seeing here truly is an astonishing amount of work. Thirdly, everything is currently fluid and developing. There are some parts of this video where I'm not going into detail because I don't want to say anything that will contrast with future updates to the instructions. Let's examine the system in a little more detail. Let's do an overview of the workflow. The first thing we need is a 3D model that's fully colored. This can either be 3D scanned or obtained from a website like Sketchfab. After that, the file needs to be processed in Blender and version 4.1 at this stage. We have a Blender project file to set up the environment, along with a custom PolySlice plugin written by Jacques. Its job is to position the model and then segment it into layers of color that of course will be printed on with the inkjet cartridge. This stage will output a folder full of PNGs for each layer, as well as a preview render and an STL with the rest of the environment set up. Our job is to now slice that STL in Orca Slicer. This is with a modified printer profile. The aim here is to generate standard G-code for our 3D printer. And at this stage, that G-code will have generic placeholders related to the 2D inkjet printing. We now have one final step to process that G-code and align the renders. And to do that, we open up the web interface and click on align. We can then select all of the PNG files plus the G-code file we just created. All of this will then process and then a zip file will be downloaded. In there will be our final G-code file and in that, those placeholders have been replaced with the exact commands needed to spray on the ink. To go with this, there'll be a folder matching the exact name, where those renders have been split up into smaller files for the individual passes needed to spray the ink. 
we transfer all of these files to the Polydi SD card and then use it to start the print. That means FDM printing as usual, but with the 2D ink applied on each layer change. So we know how it works, but how easy is it to set up? The first prerequisite is a 3D printer controlled by Marlin firmware. And that's because we need to be able to control it by a host like Octoprint. Whereas a printer running on Clipper or one from Bamboo Lab doesn't really have this functionality. In my case, I'm using this Elegoo Neptune 2 Ender 3 clone, which I featured in my last video. Next, you're going to need the hardware which will be open source, which means you can build the PCB yourself, but most likely people will purchase a kit from the store. Other aspects such as cables and SD cards, people will be able to self-source. One specific cable that you'll need needs to go between the Polydie controller and the 3D printer's mainboard. So that's USB-C on the Polydie side, and then whatever your printer needs on the other. With this Elegoo printer, needing one of these old school USB-Bs. Alternatively, you can get a USB-C adapter and then use one of your existing 3D printer cables. On the GitHub, we have some printed parts for mounting the various components. Pretty much all of them will need some sort of support and I'd recommend placing it manually as to be as precise as possible and avoid waste. You need to use some filament with a little bit of flex for this to function properly, something like PETG or ASA. Anything more brittle has a chance of snapping. We can see in the demonstration video that there's two mounts customized to the printer. These are available to suit a Creality CR6, but in my case, I had to design my own. Fortunately, the Elegoo GitHub has a full 3D model in various formats available for this printer. In my case, I took measurements from the STL for the CR6, but a guide will be provided for those that need to design their own mount with critical dimensions. I was able to design a new fan shroud printed with the slots necessary for mounting the ink cartridge. I also replaced this plastic part that holds the X end stop, extending it upwards with holes to match the main polydie PCB. So after removing support material, I could put everything together. And the steps I'm following here are based off the assembly and firmware page from the website. We're going to start by inserting some M3 nuts into the slots and the back of our shroud mount. M3 bolts then go through the holes in the inkjet cartridge holder and screw into those captive nuts. We don't do these tightly yet because we need to do some adjustment. I temporarily installed the shroud mount onto the printer and then inserted the ink cartridge still with its protective film on. We can see that the tip of the ink cartridge sits a couple of millimeters below the printed part. And you want this to sit around two millimeters off the bed when the nozzle is all the way down and touching the bed. Once you have this height correct, you can remove the ink cartridge and tighten the two mounting bolts. Next, we take the interface board and we can see that there's some very delicate pins that must be protected as we install it. It goes on the inside of the cartridge holder and snaps into place held without any fasteners. The daughter board has a matching cavity on the outside of this printed part. We first slot it in sideways and then push down to snap it into its final position. For me, this was quite tight until I cleaned up the lip where the support material was touching. Next, we have a little ribbon cable to connect these two boards and we need to pull back the little retainer on each port. We push one end of the ribbon cable into each side before locking it in place by pushing back down that retainer. The main board has its own two-part housing and we need to start by inserting some M3 nuts to be trapped in the underside. Then some M3 bolts go through the PCB and into the nut to hold it in place. The lid for this enclosure is a satisfying snap fit. The website shows the correct orientation for both the power and ribbon cables so double check them to avoid letting out the magic smoke. Just follow the images and plug them between the two boards. At this point, I chose to do the firmware and the process has already improved since the instructions were written for this page. All we have to do is format an SD card and place two firmware files on it before installing it into the main board. Like a 32-bit 3D printer, when we power it on, the firmware will flash and update. And this can be verified by the firmware changing from .bin to .cur. We can now add another file called wifi.txt and add in our SSID and password for our network. Now, when we boot up the Polydie mainboard, we should be able to connect to it using the phantom.local URL. And it is important to use this rather than the local IP address from your network. With the firmware working, I then finished off my install by sliding in the part cooling and heatsink fans into my printed shroud. I then bolted the shroud back onto the printer and removed the protective strip from the ink cartridge. This is inserted with the pins facing the interface board by putting the lip in first and then pushing down until it clips into place. We can also plug in the USB cable between the 3D printer's main board and the Polydie main board. 
Polidi should connect automatically and you can send something like M503 to make sure serial communication is happening. Ideally, you'll also mount the Polydi mainboard somewhere near the tool head where the ribbon cables can reach and it won't get snagged during its normal range of movement. And that brings us to calibration and slicer setup, which again has a dedicated page in the instructions. There's quite a few files that you'll need from the GitHub, so it's probably faster to just download the whole thing as a zip. And these files are to make your life easier because the blender stage is already done for you, so you can start from step two. Just quickly, the setup of the slicer. G-code sequences are supplied that simply get pasted in for before layer change and during layer change. We have the layer height and first layer height specified. We'll need a five millimeter or wider brim to catch any ink overspray. And we need tight control of the printer movements. So that means turning off dynamic acceleration throughout the print. Not doing so will break the YOY alignment as the timing will be off. We also need to turn off any variable layer height, including the support height being independent. So the total number of layers matches the number of image slices generated by Blender. We start with a crude measurement of the offset from the inkjet cartridge tip to the nozzle tip. It's hard to know exactly where the center is, but don't worry, this will be refined with further steps. Then in the top corner of the web interface, we come to printer settings, and there's a field for us to put both the X and Y offsets before we click save and then power cycle. The next calibration is called YOY and we manually home the printer and move the nozzle two millimeters off the bed and to the lower left. Then when we run the YOYG code, it will go back and forth, 2D printing a horizontal line in a series of passes, except because you haven't calibrated yet, there's a fair chance that they're not going to be a line, they're going to be disconnected chunks. This is a critical test to tune the timing of when the various ink passes go down. And we have some alignment buttons for this that we can click in real time, until the segments line up perfectly to form a single line. The test is repeated until you're happy and then you once again power cycle. The next test is to fine tune the XY offset and we have a large printed square with a 2D square printed within. We take a photo of this directly from above and then we have a very clever section in the web interface where we drag a virtual square to match the size of what was printed and shown in the photo. Once we've stored the positions of both the 2D and 3D square, we click calculate and the changes to our offset are given on the screen. These are simply added to whatever our previous values were and this will give us a new value that we enter into the field before clicking save and power cycling to store. The last test is for fine XY offset calibration where we print a small cube that's going to have a rainbow pattern applied to the outside. The idea is during the print we eyeball the alignment and use these buttons to baby step into the correct alignment in real time. You can see where I've dialed this in and the color application has shifted throughout the print. Let's talk about current performance and current problems. First things first, the results that Jacques and Bianca achieved are simply outstanding. Polydye can give such varied and vibrant colors and even do images on the side of 3D prints. This type of full color 3D printing has just not been available up until this point, particularly using cheap 3D printers. Let's talk about how vibrant the colors are and compared to what you're seeing here, my results aren't nearly as vivid, and that's because I'm not using the recommended white filament that has a bit of translucency, I'm just using generic white. Multi-filament color will always give a stronger appearance, but Polydi offers blending and gradients not possible in any other way. Let's talk about the cartridges, and the tips tend to dry up, and this can be problematic. The solution for this is wiping them with a little bit of paper towel at the start of the print. This dislodges anything that was stuck there and draws through more ink, getting everything flowing. At the moment, the print head pauses to allow you to wipe it before the 2D color is applied for layer one. However, you don't want to be doing this every layer because you're going to waste a lot of ink. We can see in his video that Jacques has a wiper and automates this process, and there's nothing to stop users from adding the same type of system and tweaking the before layer change G-code to wipe at specific intervals. Temperature and humidity will dictate how soon everything dries up, so some user tuning might be required to suit their specific conditions. When the ink cartridge dries up mid-print, you just get white surfaces where there should be color. Let's talk about cost, and a beta testing unit that comes with all of the electronics is 199 US. On top of this, you'll still need USB cables and of course the ink cartridge. And the price of this still compares favorably to something like a Bamboo Lab AMS, and of course a Prusa XL and it is important to state that this currently is in beta. The installation on Jacques CR6 is reliable and repeatable, but we've encountered an annoying bug on my Neptune 2, 
or the color loses its synchronization from around nine millimeters up. From this back angle, it's a lot more obvious and we think we're close to getting to the bottom of it. And that's why my prints in this video have been limited to models scaled to be less than nine millimeters tall. So who is this for? In the future, hopefully everybody. But at this stage, it's for experienced 3D printers who can methodically work through testing and provide detailed feedback. If that sounds like you, all of the links you need are down below in the video description. Let me know what you think of Polydi in the comments. Thanks to Jacques and Bianca for all of their hard work. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, happy full color 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.